Welcome to this evening. Um, I'm Nicola Hoggard Cregan, the co-director of New Zealand Christians and Science, as you probably all know by now. And Chris is here and Sarah Wilson is here, the program director for ISCAS. It's um, a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ruth Barton, who will be taking us back into the fascinations of history tonight. Um, Ruth is an historian of science and technology and is an authority on the X Club. I don't know whether you brought your book, Ruth, but um, the X Club was the coterie of influential Darwinians who dominated science and its culture in mid-Victorian England. And her recent book is called The X Club, Power and Authority in Victorian, in, in Victorian Science. And this has been described as magisterial. Her articles on Victorian England cover many varieties of science and religious belief and unbelief. Since retiring from the history department at the University of Auckland, she has been an honorary research fellow in the School of Humanities. And she's taught me many things, but especially that all things we worry about in science and faith today have their echoes back in the 19th century. So today she will be talking about the conflict hypothesis in science and religion. But if just first we will have a prayer from Sylvia and then um, we'll pass over to Ruth. Thank you, Sylvia. Good evening and thank you and congratulations, Ruth, for uh, navigating your, your technology. I thought I'd like to, um, to, to for our prayer tonight to do a poem that, uh, that your Victorians would have memorized and known well in their time by the great Isaac Watts, uh, who kind of wrote the songbook um, for uh, England. And I don't know much about him personally, you probably know far more than I, but I'd like to read uh, the, um, the hymn lyrics, I sing the almighty power of God. I sing the almighty power of God that made the mountains rise that spread the flowering, the flowing, sorry, that, that spread the flowing sky, seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. There's not a plant or flower below, but makes thy glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. Creatures as numerous as they be are subject to thy care. There's not a place where we can flee, but God is present there. His hand is my perpetual guard. He guides me with his eye. Why should I then forget the Lord, for who is forever nigh? Lord, bless this conversation and all our thoughts, and bless Ruth this evening. We pray. Amen. All right. Well, um, good evening, and thank you all for coming. Nicola didn't mention, although you might have worked out, that I'm an IT dodo. Now, I've called this constructions of conflict. I want to argue that the warfare or eternal conflict theory of science and religion is historically inaccurate and it's created by oversimplified dichotomous thinking. Um, everyone knows that science and religion are in conflict. Um, I sat in an uh, anthropology tutorial once and um, a student with a cross around her neck said, Science and religion are in conflict with each other. I thought, oh dear, what does she think? Um, it's what one philosopher calls part of our social imaginary. And even my eminent historian colleagues will sometimes assume that science and religion are in conflict. Now I checked out Wikipedia, that great source of useful information. And it says that the conflict interpretation started in the late 19th century with these two Americans. Now, I want to argue that it really goes back much longer, but we'll just cover these two quickly. They were Andrew Dixon White and John Draper. So first John William Draper, 
This is the opening paragraph. He's writing about the ancient Greeks. No spectacle can be presented to a thoughtful mind more solemn, more mournful than that of the dying of an ancient religion, which in its day has given consolation to many generations of men. Uh, you know, they'd finally learned that the divinities of Olympus weren't there. And he's going to go on and more or less tell us that the dying of our current religion is equally sad. Um, it was written in the aftermath of um, the declaration of papal infallibility and Draper was anti-Catholic. And then, so I've got to move on. Galileo, the great example. He ventured on the publication of a work entitled The System of, a, of the World. He was summoned before the Inquisition at Rome, accused of having asserted the earth moves about the sun. On his knees with his hand on the Bible, he was compelled to abjure and curse the doctrine of the movement of the earth. What a spectacle, the most illustrious man of his age. He was then committed to prison, treated with remorseless severity during the remaining 10 years of his life and was denied burial and consecrated ground. Now, I don't know if he, what about the burial, but he was not committed to prison. He went off to live in the house of um, some eminent churchman on the outskirts of Rome. And then he was allowed to go back to his house in Florence. And um, it was house arrest to be sure, but he was allowed visitors. And so, he did not so badly for the rest of his life. Now, Andrew Dixon White has a slightly different title. It's warfare, not just conflict, but it's science with theology in Christendom. Um, and he, he gave an earlier lecture on it when he looked more like that scruffy person on the top right. In all modern history, interference with science and the supposed interest of religion has resulted in the direst evils, both to religion and science, and invariably. What we want is untrammeled scientific investigation. Now, I said that I would talk about Galileo. This may be taking far too long, but um, Galileo is the great hero, the martyr, and the symbol of science oppressed by religion. He was a teacher of mathematics at the University of Pisa when he heard about the telescope. And he thought he could work out how to do it and um, how to make a better one. Now, um, Pisa, what, oh, sorry, no. Then he went to Padua in the Republic of Venice. And as you know, the Venetians are glassmakers. Forget the last sentence. And he thought he could make a better telescope than he'd heard about. Good glassmakers um, in, in Venice. And he produced a telescope with nine times magnification. And so he rushed off to um, show it to the leaders of Venice. The said Galileo presents this instrument to your serenity out of deep affection and is one of the fruits of the science he has been teaching for over 17 years at the University of Padua. And Galileo promised that he wouldn't make a telescope for any foreign government. He would only make it for the Venetian Senate. You could see when your ships were coming in so um, it, it was good for insurance purposes, but if you were at war, you could see ships coming towards you maybe half an hour before they could see you. Um, and so there he is at Padua, and he, after um, looking out into the distance and deciding it would be useful um, politically and commercially, he then turns his um, telescope to the sky. Um, first, the moon. The surface of the moon is not even smooth and perfectly spherical as the majority of philosophers have conjectured. Um, but it's rough and uneven. Looks like it has mountains and 
um, valleys, just like the face of the earth. Now, this showed Aristotle was wrong, because according to Aristotle, the moon was totally smooth. The Bible you know, has nothing to say about whether the moon is smooth or uneven. Um, and he produced a whole lot of discoveries about the moon with his telescope. Um, he turned it then to the planets and discovered, after very careful watching over um, a couple of weeks, that there were stars near um, Jupiter that moved. And they moved in relation to each other, which they weren't supposed to do. And he decided, and this was enormously significant, that these were moons of Jupiter. So Jupiter had moons going around it. And what does he do? But name it, the site. Um, he writes a book about it. And he uh, dedicates it to the Medici, the Medici, he wants to go home to Florence. That's his hometown. And he'd said that if you work for a republic, you have to do too much work. You really want to be attached to a court where you only have to uh, um, bring, uh, sort of bring some sort of celebrity to the court. Um, so within three years of saying he would never make his telescopes for anyone else, he decides he gets a position at the University of, Padu of um, Pisa. And no, I'm sorry. IT does no good to me. He gets a position back in Florence at the Medici court, and they are willing to appoint him court mathematician. But he says, um, please, will you also appoint me court philosopher? Mathematicians were, it was just a descriptive subject. Philosophy was what gave explanations. So he wants to give explanations. Now, once he'd shown that the moon was uneven and that there were stars or uh, moons going around Jupiter, he could say, well, there isn't just one center of rotation in the universe. Not everything goes around the Earth. So maybe, perhaps we are going around the sun. And people, you know, challenged him and said, well, this is against the Bible. So what does he do? But he decides he'll write an exposition of scripture. Now, this is after the Reformation, um, after the Council of Trent, and only dangerous Protestants uh, writing expositions of scripture. Um, it should be left to church authorities. It is most pious to say and most prudent to take for granted that Holy Scripture can never lie as long as its true meaning has been grasped. If in interpreting it, someone were to limit himself always to the pure literal meaning, then he could make scripture appear to be full, not only of contradictions and false propositions, but also serious heresies and blasphemies. For one would attribute to God feet, hands, eyes, anger, contrition, hatred, forgetfulness. Since these propositions dictated by the Holy Spirit were expressed by the sacred writers in such a way as to accommodate the capacities of the very unrefined and undisciplined masses. And then he quotes um, uh, someone he calls an ecclesiastic, that the intention of the Holy Ghost is to teach us how one goes to heaven, not how heaven goes. And that is just the beginning. Um, so Galileo mightn't have been the most pious of people, but he seems to have believed in um, a genuine, if not deeply felt, manner. Um, he later wrote that God wrote the book of Matthew, 
of nature in the language of mathematics that triangles and circles and lines are the way that God planned the universe. Now, he's not the only person of his time who made these sorts of statements. So here's a few others, which maybe I should hurry with. So here is Johannes Kepler, um, contemporary of Galileo. He thought God planned the universe around the seven perfect solids of um, Pythagoras and Plato. Um, discussing God at the same time as you were discussing astronomy was totally satisfactory. And here's Isaac Newton. He again is doing philosophy, natural philosophy. And thus much concerning God, to discourse of whom from the appearance of things does certainly belong to natural philosophy. So including God in your, we would say scientific, but they saw themselves as doing natural philosophy, which is a, a somewhat different activity. So, right, that's all 17th century. Now, for those of you who aren't historians, I've got this little chart, 1600s to 17th century, and that's Galileo, Copernicus, Newton right at the end of the time. 1700s is the 18th century, the Enlightenment. Um, 1789, the French Revolution, we'll get a mention, and then the 1800s were into um, 19th century and industrial revolution. Now I'm going to look at three people who I think present a kind of science versus religion account hundreds of years earlier. Now that sad picture of Huxley there um, is again my IT problems. I couldn't work out how to get the the colour out of it, because I was copying from a previous one. And what we have, Bernard de Fontenelle, who wrote obituaries, his scientists turned out secular saints. The Marquis de Condorcet set up reason, tolerance and humanity against authority, authority tyranny, superstition, prejudice, timid, timidity. And Thomas Huxley, who oppose skepticism and deference to authority. So they set up these definitions that they claim apply to what philosophers and scientists do against what religious people think. So I start with Bernard Le Beauvier de Fontenelle. He lived to be within one month of a hundred and um, he was appointed close to the close to 1700 perpetual secretary of the Academy of Sciences. And if you can see my little tag there, he's sitting second from the right in the front row towards the end of his life, looking a bit sleepy. Right. Now, the 1687, he wrote a history of oracles. And it was an explanation for the Delphic oracles of ancient Greece. Now, you think, what does this have to do with religion? Well, it's ancient Greek religion. And he gave an explanation, a natural explanation for the oracles. In Catholic tradition, the oracles were the work of demons. But according to Fontenelle, they were the product of gases emanating from the earth which were found to have strange effects on people. Fraudulent priests, he said, took advantage of the credulity of the masses and persuaded them that the behavior of people affected by inhaling fumes was really the voice of the oracle. Now, at the time, it was controversial. Philosophers and theologians were worried. What did he mean? Did he mean that fraudulent priests were misleading the Christian faithful? Perhaps Christian miracles could be explained by natural causes. Um, 
He didn't say, and even his friends didn't know whether or not he believed. Um, I mean, Galileo believed. Uh, he had a Christian faith. Fontenelle may not have. And then it was his job as a secretary to write a loge for the funeral um, uh, when members of the academy died. Um, oh dear, that's a typing mistake there. They were devoted to their studies and they cared nothing for fame or money or comfort. Now, Reynaud rid himself of all business matters, especially all matters of intrigue, and he valued very highly the advantage, so little sought, of being a nobody. Um, Moraldi's character was that which the sciences form ordinarily in those who make it their sole occupation, seriousness, simplicity, righteousness. And now the um, members of the academy were just as quarrelsome and just as keen to make money as any scientist is now. Um, and they did care about their status. They, none of them wanted to be nobodies, but this was the way he built up science. Now, he was writing that in the first half of the 18th century. Next one, um, the Marquis de Condorcet, sketch for a historical picture of the progress of the human mind. He was an aristocrat, but was pro-revolution. But he happened to be on the wrong side. He was a Girondin. And when the other side uh, wrote a new um, I've forgotten, um, a political statement, he disagreed. And so a warrant was put out for his arrest. In hiding, he was in hiding when he wrote this wonderful optimistic piece on the progress of the human mind. He was, he had to leave his hiding place. He was caught, put in prison, and he was dead the next morning. It's thought that he took poison. So here are some extracts. Up to, up to this stage, the crimes of the clergy have gone unpunished. The protestations of oppressed humanity and of outraged reason have been smothered in blood and flames. Um, if you look at my two lists there, on the one side, you have the things he praises. On the other side, all the things that are associated with religion. But I mean, he was especially talking about Catholic religion, but every now and then he broke in to say the Protestants weren't much better. The fear of punishment and torture soon put an end to such imprudent frankness. Italy and France were sullied with the blood of martyrs for the freedom of thought. All sects and governments and every authoritarian but body were in accord on this alone, that they were against reason. Reason had to be covered with a veil which hid it from the gaze of tyrants, but let it be seen by philosophy. Copernicus revived the correct theory of the system of the universe, which had been forgotten for so long and eradicated it from anything that was repellent to sensory experience by means of the theory of apparent movements. He set up the extreme simplicity of real movements that results from the system, in contrast to the almost fatuous complexity of those demanded by the Ptolemaic hypothesis. Galileo applied the recent discovery of the telescope perfected by himself to astronomy. And he goes on about um, what uh, disasters the church and disgrace the church brought upon itself by condemning Galileo. Now, um, half the things he said are false, 
um, Copernicus's system was not simple, uh, but these are the statements that got set into a tradition that often gets repeated one person after the other. Popular lectures were given around the countryside in French, in France and in England. So we've had sort of 1700 to 1750. This was published 1795 after uh, Condorcet's death. And now we move on to 1766. And I haven't got Huxley's um, pictures scattered over all this. Now you have to imagine um, this lecture on the advisableness of improving natural knowledge was the first meeting of the Sunday Lecture Society, which was going to compete with church meetings um, to give improving lectures to the people of London. Now, it is utterly magnificent, I think, in its construction of an argument. I don't know how long it took him to, to produce it, but he's standing in the center of London and he begins, here we stand only a few yards from where 200 years ago, just as the plague was dying down, the fire of London broke out. At the time, people bl blamed God for the plague and the papists for the fires. But we now know better. We no longer have such fires and plagues. And we know that it wasn't God that brought the plague and it wasn't the papists that brought the fires. Because at that time, a few men, calm and thoughtful, he said they were, banded themselves together for the purpose of improving natural knowledge. We now have machines to fight fires and we know how to counter play because of the advance of natural knowledge. And if the founders of that society, it was the Royal Society of London, um, could come back now, they would be astounded by what they found. All these great ships, railways, telegraphs, factories, printing presses, without aid, the aid of which society would collapse, um, these have all been produced by science. Well, it wasn't true. The steam engine didn't need um, scientific um, theories behind it. Um, Many of these things were produced by clever artisans, just um, making things a little more complicated, trying it out. So, but he says all these wonderful things are produced by science, but then he sort of goes the other way. But these are just the ripples and bubbles upon the surface of that great spiritual stream, the springs of which only he was seeing, but we now see that this is where that spiritual stream of natural knowledge has led us. But spinning jenny and steam pump are after all but toys, possessing an accidental value, and natural knowledge creates multitudes of more subtle contrivances, the praises of which we do not happen to sing because they are not directly convertible into instruments for creating wealth. So, you know, the masses just care about wealth and comfort and so on. But I, Huxley, am different. Uh, we're gonna miss that one for time. Um, but he says, I don't, I would care nothing for science if it was merely a comfort machine. Some see nature just a bountiful mother of humanity, a sort of comfort driving machine. But it isn't, uh, science is not just, natural knowledge is not only conferring practical benefits on men. In so doing, it has affected a revolution in their conceptions of the universe and of themselves and has profoundly altered their modes of thinking and their views of right and wrong. 
I say that natural knowledge seeking to satisfy natural wants has found the ideas that can alone still spiritual cravings. I say that natural knowledge in desiring to ascertain the laws of comfort has been driven to discover those of, I think it's tr um, meaning, but um, I was intended to go and get the page while I was trying to get everything else working. And then we come to the culmination of it all. So what are the moral convictions most fondly held by barbarous and semi-barbarous people? These are the convictions that authority is the soundest basis of belief, that merit attaches to the readiness to believe, that the doubting disposition is a bad one and skepticism is sin. Um, and the people that believe this are barbarous and semi-barbarous. So he's implying that half the Christians of his age were barbarous and semi-barbarous. There are many excellent persons who yet hold by these principles. And it is not my present business or intention to discuss their views. All I wish to bring clearly before your minds is the unquestionable fact that the improvement of natural knowledge is affected by methods which directly give the lie to all these convictions and assume the exact reverse to be true. The improver of natural knowledge absolutely refuses to acknowledge authority as such. For him, skepticism is the highest of duties, blind faith the one unpardonable sin. This is the only way that science has progressed. And it must be admitted that the great ideas, some of which I have indicated, and the ethical spirit which I have endeavoured to sketch in the few moments which remain at my disposal, constitute the real and permanent significance of natural knowledge. So natural knowledge is about skepticism, always questioning barbarous and semi-barbarous people. Well, they want to believe authorities and, and not doubt. And it seems to me that, I mean, Huxley is the most conspicuous, but the Condorcet and Fontenelle as well. It's not, it's not the word science and religion that matter. Huxley's talking about natural knowledge. The others were using reason, but they're setting up oppositions. They're defining categories to be as opposite each other as they possibly can. Um, and maybe a few uh, religious believers, whether in um, Christianity or Islam or Judaism, where there are books to be and authorities to be believed. Maybe some people only accept authority without any um, reasons. But all these authors are setting up, they're making definitions that are as far apart from each other as possible. They do not fit religious belief and they do not fit science. Um, but that's another debate about what science is. Um, thank you. I've no idea how long I was. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, can you unshare again now? Well, that's that was a whirlwind tour. Um, yes, it was a bit. Sorry. So, no, that's wonderful. So now we need questions. Um, can you please put your questions in the chat? I mean, Huxley is 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 referring to the Christians as being sort of gullible and and giving into authority, whereas we seem to live in a world where the Christians are the ones that are rebelling against authority. Yes, but on the basis of another authority, surely. Yes, perhaps, yes. Yeah. Um, and yes, they're ignoring science, you see. They're ignoring natural knowledge as, as if they have some other authority that will look after them. Um, yes, but I, I, see, I see the point. Mm. Um. Richard Harris, do you want to give your question? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so I'm asking how many of these gentlemen were Freemasons? <laughs> uh, I know, I, I suspect that if, uh, some of these ideas um, were held by Freemasons and um, some of them, um, uh, you know, Freemasons were part of the, the uh, 
movement against this uh, against um, um, biblical belief. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Well, um, Huxley wasn't, and none of his close friends were. Okay. Um, did the Freemasons start in the 18th century? I, I, um, yes. I yes. think Fontenelle, did they start in France or with the Netherlands? I think Fontenelle would have been too early and mm. I do not I know, know. I know Swedenborg was one of the early ones. Yeah. Was he? Yes. No, I know someone who's written about Swedenborg and he didn't mention that he was... Um, Mm. Mm. Okay. Although Swedenborg, you know, had a devout religion, yeah. even if it might not be the same as ours. Mm. 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 Yeah, so I'm not sure if that, yeah, I quite believe that these ideas were circulating among Masons, but mm. as far as I know, none of these were Masons. Um, yeah. Condorcet was a very eminent mathematician who wanted to apply, apply mathematics to the social world. Yeah. Oh, it's a, sort of a side issue, perhaps, to the main, the main things that you're focusing on. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ian, do you want to give your comment, please? Yeah, uh, when I was doing some studies on this, uh, I came across... Uh, a note that Huxley in one of his letters to a friend just said he'd had a close look at the Galileo controversy and to his mind the church had more of the rights of it than Galileo did, which is quite interesting given Huxley's general comments. And I did have the luxury of finding his correspondence and looking at the book and yes, there it is. I can't give you chapter and verse at the moment, so I had to write to the Hebrews somewhere it says Right. I have, I haven't come across that letter. I'm a Huxley expert. I have never come across that letter. Um, Huxley was very, very cunning. He was reading the Jesuits so he could argue with the Catholics. Um, one of the early Jesuits, um, he decided he'd read. He was he was as subtle as any Jesuit is reputed to be himself. Um, and it is the case that the church did have the right on it. Well, it, not the church, um, not, not the Pope who condemned him, but the, the Jesuit mathematicians at the time had um, a compromise position. They were following the astronomer Tycho Brahe, a Danish philosopher who had the earth in the center of the universe, the sun going around the earth, and then circulating around the sun as it went around the earth were all the other planets. And that was that was the best view at the time. The trouble with Galileo was that physics and, math and physics and astronomy were contradictory. Um, oh, I, um, let me give you an example to see if you could work it out. Um, there's a new children's book. It's called The Sun is a Star. And I thought this sounded good and I'd buy it for my godson. And then I got it, and it makes mistakes in its history. So I wrote the corrections in and sent it to him. Um, but it says the church ignored the common sense that the earth is going around that the earth is going around the sun rather than at rest in the middle. Um, how many of you feel as if you're on orbit, you're, you know, on orbit around the sun, and at the same time, you're spinning. So the earth is spinning and going around the sun. So you have at least a double rotation. And I don't think any of us can feel it. We feel like we're at rest. 
Um, so I feel like writing to Dick Frizzell and telling him he's wrong. But, mm. Right. Um, more questions? Um, while more questions are coming, you can um, tell William what it is you, you think he can do to help this process of, um, of calming the, the conflict between religion and science. I don't know. None of us can stop it because the whole, uh, yeah, well, a very large proportion of people in our society um, think it. And it's hard to change what masses of people think. But you can just say you don't think so. But really, you have to read and think for yourself so that when people you know are saying, well, I think they're in conflict because whatever they're saying, you have to start knowing something, knowing enough to say, well, I don't think so because it's no point saying, well, I heard a lecture and she said, because they didn't hear the lecture and, and they won't be convinced by someone they've never seen and don't know. So you just have to learn things at the level of all the people you know so that you can talk to them, I think. It's a big so, job, William. It's a very big job, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I started this 40, 50 years ago. <laughs> so you, you can get a long way in less than 50 years. <laughs> so I think you want to minimize really, you know, the, the basic um, conflict between science and religion, right, Ruth? Um, but when you get someone like Huxley, he doesn't sound very peaceful. He's trying, as you say, to make a, a conflict. Yes, Huxley's trying to make a conflict. Um, Huxley was a very angry man. Um, he said having a row with um, Gladstone, the, um, the high church prime minister, they, they um, wrote articles on miracles in the, the intellectual monthlies at the time. Having a row with Gladstone, um, rescued him from uh, depression. Right. <laughs> um, he, he was angry. Um, he came from a very poor family. He, um, people who were poor couldn't go to Oxford and Cambridge. If you, you, you couldn't get a position at Oxford and Cambridge unless you remember of the established church and prepared to affirm the articles, the 39 articles. Um, up till 1871, you could not be a fellow at Oxford and Cambridge, which meant uh, sort of having a comfortable life with no, no responsibilities and just doing what you research you liked. You couldn't be a fellow unless you, you affirmed the articles. So he was left out and he, it was one of the reasons he was angry. And I think it was just part of his personality too. Um, I suppose what I'm arguing against is that there's an essential conflict that the nature of religion mm. is such and the nature mm. of science is such mm. that they have to be in conflict. Mm. Um, I am not saying there haven't been conflicts. I'm not saying that there aren't quite difficult questions to answer mm -hmm. and that sometimes theology has to, to change or what we thought we believed. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to decide, well, this science must be faulty. I just don't believe the assumptions it's making. Mm -hmm. Or I'd better start rereading and sometimes science has to change too oh yes mm -hmm. yes but that science has to change and you say well and it might it might take decades mm -hmm. um so yes. ian do you want to um um come in here oh yeah i'll have another go 
okay. in my reading, which I can't recall in detail again, uh, but I seem mm -hmm. to recall that uh, Huxley had a uh, another very fairly important motivating factor, namely he wanted to create an opening for the profession of scientists and the payment of them, rather than have science being a backyard hobby of spare clergymen, and so uh, not a, not allowing the uh, secular scientists a proper swing at their potential profession. Uh, yes, this is the um, professionalization theory that really what that Huxley really wasn't having an argument against religion. It was only the position that the privileged position of the clergy and their kind of natural theology arguments. I think um, it is a very widely held view, and I'm one of its well-known opponents. Um, so in my view, professionalization and the need to get an income for scientists does not explain, uh, it might explain some of the bitterness that, and the anger that is in Huxley's work, but it doesn't explain his opposition to religion. He, he was a materialist when he was 14 years old. He was, he was talking to the Unitarians in his hometown because he left school and he wandered around the streets and um, if people would talk to this rather brilliant young boy and loan him books, then that's what he did. And he was trying out materialist views with a, um, with a Unitarian in Coventry. Um, 18, early 1840s, I think. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, uh, we have to get on, on a bit here. Um, just one last question then from John Dunlop. Do you want to unmute? You have to unmute, John. Um, well, John's not managing to unmute. So, um, me. Asks, yes, I've unmuted. Oh, okay, okay. Good. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, Ruth, I want to say thank you for bringing your students along and providing excellent breakfasts all those years ago. <laughs> and um, I think you inspired me when I finally made it overseas to go and check out Galileo's pickled finger in the uh, museum in Florence, and indeed to read his original log books. So thank you for that. Um, he, Galileo was indeed rather, um, rather dedicated in observing those moons. Um, but I guess for me, I, I see now the one branch of the church has come up with a new sort of science, a, a, a Christian sort of science. How would you address them if you were speaking to them? Ah. Well, they wouldn't want to listen to me. Uh, but when I was still working this out for myself, I suppose the thing that really persuaded me the young earth wasn't on was the discoveries. Oh, well, I suppose I had thought that there was, there is a very long time period of, in geology. Uh, that uh, to suppose that God put all the fossils there as to give the appearance of age seems to me to um, be a kind of uh, a, a rather weak hypothesis. Um, but the thing that I found particularly interesting was looking at the evidence that humans were around because they had left um, tools at the same time as long extinct animals. And that it was pushing human history back into geological time that really convinced me that you had to have everything in a very, very long time scale, that there was, that Adam and Eve were not real people. Um, that's where I'd start. 
That might take a long time too. Oh, okay. yes. And the other thing is my biochemist friend who might be around somewhere this evening, he talks about the, the evidence of um, genetic code and all the interconnections between all the creatures, human mm. and mm. others. <clears throat> that shows we're closely related. And it's... <clears throat> Ruth, if I heard you correctly, you said in passing that uh, what, what was referred to as natural philosophy uh, was, quote, somewhat different, your words, I think, yes, that's from what, what we would call science. And I was surprised by that because I've always been, I've always taken what was referred to as natural philosophy simply to mean um, the love of wisdom concerning nature, which is what science, natural science is. So would you care to elaborate on how they're somewhat different, please? Yes. Now, um, as I understand it, philosophy was an explanatory discipline. So philosophy, and I'm talking about 16th, 17th centuries, philosophy was the grander explanation. It offered, it operated at a level of explanation. Um, I mean, there, there was alchemy and sometimes called chemistry. There were the mathematical sciences, um, optics, music, and astronomy were all based on mathematics, but they were descriptions, not explanations. There was natural history, which described sort of plants and animals. And natural philosophy was philosophy about nature. It was attempting to give a larger explanatory view. Now, the Old, older view, like when I was a student 50 years ago or, or 40 years ago, um, was that natural philosophy and science were continuous with each other. And natural philosophy, I think there are still some chairs in Scottish universities. The chair of natural philosophy is a physics chair. But One of the things that when the 17th century people talk about natural philosophy, they always say God is part of the discussion. When Descartes and um, Boyle and so on were arguing about atoms, they always wondered, you know, could God divide atoms? And that was part of the debate. So one current view is that Something changed in the early 19th century and God was no longer part of the discussion. And that when the 19th century English at least talk about science, they do not intend to refer to God or the divine or a creator or anything like that. Um, but that, that's a sort of a level of interpretation of how you explain the changes over hundreds of years and what is acceptable science and what is not acceptable. May, may I just two quick things, Nicola, in response? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Ruth, that's very interesting. I, I'm still somewhat surprised because I always took philosophy, at least in its early days, to be an all-encompassing term to refer to all learning. And mathematics would have counted as part of philosophy just as much as um, uh, something that you would describe as more explanatory. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I, I'd be a bit wary about that shift you're describing because it sounds as if it's becoming a question begging uh, distinction. Namely, if there's some reference to God, then it can't, by definition, count as science. And, and that is, as I say, question begging as far as this whole dispute is concerned. So I'd, I'd, I would want to be issuing a challenge to that, that um, uh, mandating of the use of science in that way. Now, that's not to say that we need to be talking of God when we do our physics or whatever, but but simply saying, well, if there is any explanatory reference to God 
in our scientific discussion, then it's not scientific. That strikes me as um, a stipulation of a philosophical kind that we should be challenging for what that's worth. Yes, yes, I quite see that that is question begging. Um, there's someone as recently, like four years ago, written a book called Maxwell, Maxwell's Demon and Huxley's God, I think, um, and argues that someone as devout as Maxwell, the mid 19th century um, mathematical physicist, he did not refer to God. In um, uh, Lord Kelvin was devout, that neither of them seemed to want to refer to God when they wrote about physics. Um, they were addendums at the end of lectures. It wasn't part of the discussion of physics. So that it's not just a shift that's made by the rationalists and the atheists or those who want to leave God out, that it's part of a more general shift. But I agree, in some ways it's question begging, and in some ways, the Enlightenment had changed mm. um, perceptions of what could be discussed and what was real and what sort of ways things were real. Um, back yes. to philosophy, in the medieval university, um, the mathematical sciences were separate and lower than philosophy. Interesting. Mathematics was was not, and it was Galileo and our modern world that says mathematics is explanatory. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And it was part of the um, the decline of Aristotelianism, which didn't see, which was being attacked on many grounds in the 16th and 17th centuries. Yeah. Well, of course, in the Aristotelian model, final causes were hugely central to explanation. Mm -hmm. um, with Galileo and the and the revolution, uh, it's not final causes anymore, but the other um, of the three Aristotelian causes at work. You know all that. Anyway, this is very interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Donald, Newt. That's not a question. Maybe what is the comment? Yeah, but this is me. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, uh, yeah. I was talking about uh, Newton's universal gravitation. Yeah. And what that means. that's a very good law. I think I think somebody was saying the way we don't feel the earth spinning. Oh. Mm. Ruth was saying Thank that. You. Don't. Um, it was only when a new physics was developed with a new concept of momentum that you could explain that continuing spinning in a circle, we will not feel, we'll only feel when it shifts. Um, but Newton's uh, concept of gravity was regarded as unbelievable by many uh, continental philosophers. Leibniz says to have gone to all that trouble with all that mathematics over something incomprehensible like gravity action at a distance. Um, so it, it took decades. The British all thought Newton was great, but the French and the Germans were much more doubtful and it took a while to believe it. I think it wasn't until mid 18th century when the French sent off um, expeditions to measure the um, to measure the radius of the earth. They went to Lapland and they went to somewhere in Central America or South America. And they found that the earth was squashed this way, which is what like. said. And instead of lengthened that way, which is what Descartes said. So then Newton had apparently won. But I mean, another book. The one another book um Another book, um, I read a couple of chapters, I'm not very good at reading, uh, Stephen Hawking, something like God Created the Integers. That, that is a mathematical book from many years ago as well. Ah. God, God Created the Integers, and all the rest was some man or something, I'm not too sure. Or the, yes, or the devil. Um, 
Yes. Uh, I bought Stephen Hawking on, on was it was it Time or the Universe or something? And Brief History. Yes. At, at about page five, he had Galileo all wrong, so I decided to stop reading. <laughs> I thought that was someone reliable on this sort of subject if he was wrong that soon. <laughs> well, um, perhaps we, unless somebody has a hand up, I think perhaps we should stop there. Thank you for all your, your um, answers to all these um, tricky questions. And I would recommend that everybody reads her book, um, The X Club, if you want to know all the details of all these um, gentlemen who met around around Darwin in the in the 19th century. Thank you so much Ruth for your delightful whimsical and uh, quite insightful presentation really enjoyed it. Uh, let's give thanks. Heavenly Father we thank you for the minds that you have given us so that we can both write books and read them that we can both critique what others have said and written and be critiqued ourselves that we can see consistencies and inconsistencies. I uh, thank you, Lord, for the, the work that you have done uh, through Ruth on our behalf. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to really think about these things again and really you know, grasp afresh the conflict model and understand some of its roots. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.